Hello, everyone. You're just going to give everybody a second to come in and go ahead and get started. Hello, everybody, and welcome, and thank you so much for joining us on this session of the development of the Conservation District in Brunswick, Maryland. Um, today's session is part of our ongoing uh, webinar series, which is um, our version this year of the uh, Old Line State Summit. Um, so thank you to all of our speakers for being with us today. My name is Jessica Felt, and I am the Preservation Initiatives Manager at Preservation Maryland. Um, just a little housekeeping before we get started and introduce our speakers. Um, we are going to be continuing to have uh, sessions throughout 2020. Um, we do have some sessions coming up next month on retrofitting suburbs and cemetery documentation and information um, on those sessions and how to register um, is available on our website uh, at Old Line State. Uh, I'm sorry, Old Line State Summit.org or PresMD.org. Um, I also want to take a moment to thank our sponsors for their support of this program, uh, Whiting Turner, the Maryland Historical Trust, Worcester, Eisenbrandt, Brennan and Company, and the Middendorf Foundation. Um, these sponsors, along with support from members and donors, um, make it possible for us to be able to present these sessions uh, free of charge, and we really thank everybody for their support. Um, today, we're gonna be having a conversation with three key players in the uh, conservation district process in Brunswick. And this is our, a little bit of a new format for us. If you've attended some of our other sessions, we are gonna be having a conversation and we certainly hope that you are also a part of this conversation um, and, and contribute your questions and um, you know some follow up on to what we're saying. Um, so our first panelist is Nathan Brown, a lifelong Brunswick resident who served on the city council from 2018 to 2020 and was just elected as mayor in August of 2020. We are also joined by Andrew St. John, a member of the Brunswick City Council with a lifelong love of old buildings and railroads. And finally, we have Kelly White, who is the chair of the Brunswick Preservation and Revitalization Committee. Uh, thank you guys so much for being here and for sharing your thoughts. Um, I know you've been working on this whole process for a long time, and I really appreciate you um, coming to talk about what you've learned. Um, so, like I said, I'm hoping we can also get questions from you. I'm going to be asking the panel questions, um, but I'm hoping that you will also have questions. Um, you have a question box there. Uh, feel free to uh, put in your questions at any point, and I'll give a reminder when we're kind of wrapping up the part of uh, the discussion that we, we kind of planned out to hit the points we wanted to hit, and then we're hoping maybe some stuff we left off, we're hoping you can add, and I'll give you a reminder as we wrap up kind of our portion to uh, make sure to get those in. You can enter them whenever you'd like if something occurs to you. Um, so without much further ado, we thought, um, you know, I've probably some of you do know about Brunswick, but in case you didn't, um, we do have a, um, a video that uh, kind of gives an intro to the history of the city. So um, just a couple minutes to give you kind of a sense of place for where we're talking about when we're talking about Brunswick, Maryland. So give me one second to get this started. Welcome to Brunswick, Maryland, a big town, small city. Long ago, Brunswick, like many other mid-Atlantic towns and cities, was a vibrant, bustling community thanks to the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad and the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal. Over time, the contributions of the railroad changed and the CNO Canal ceased its operations. Today, the rail moves freight and commuters heading to Washington, D.C. and points east. On the banks of the Potomac River, outdoor recreation abounds for visitors and residents. One of the largest attractions, the CNO Canal plays backdrop to the million plus visitors who pass through Brunswick during their bicycling trips from Georgetown to Cumberland. Like many canal towns, the foot traffic from these visitors helps support Brunswick's businesses. True to its roots in history, Brunswick celebrates its railroad heritage at the annual Railroad Days. A continued commitment to community and patriotism, the annual Veterans Day Parade is one of the oldest continual parades in the country.
History from the earliest days is preserved and shared at the local Brunswick Museum, where several floors are filled with images, artifacts, and interactive displays. In its heyday, Brunswick was the place to be seen, to shop, and to socialize. The local fire hall has hosted local and national performers, including Duke Ellington, Patsy Cline, and many big band acts of the day. Older generations still reminisce about the performances and dances that took place in Brunswick. A great example of current investment, the reopening of this event space will help bring a renewed sense of interest in Brunswick. Often referred to as a diamond in the rough, Brunswick is enriched by rural beauty, abundant recreation, a rich history, and opportunities for revitalization to its once thriving Main Street. Brunswick is a community filled with vision and opportunity. Okay, give me one second. That's our first time with a video, so I'm figuring out how I get out of the video. There we go, show. Okay, we're gonna go, and actually we're going to pull up um, some images of Brunswick for while we are doing this as well. So let me uh, just pull up this and so we can get, there we go. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, so that's a little overview of Brunswick, and I don't know if you guys have anything else you wanna add just about, um, you know, to help set the stage for what you were looking at and what you were looking to um, the, the what what kind of community Brunswick is that maybe the video didn't touch on. Go ahead, Nathan. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to unmute. Sorry. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I think that, you know, what the video really showed is what I think many um, municipalities across the state and really across the country can kind of speak to that, you know, m many have Main Street districts that are of historic significance, um, that at one time, you know, different industries may have been in their, in their areas, and that's what we had, the railroad industry was huge here, and you know, when that when those operations changed, it really caused a significant change um, in, in our area, but we still would like to see that area preserved and see people, um, you know, hang out in our downtown. And I think, you know, that is something that is, is kind of coming back. People are looking for these kind of areas to come and visit and, and walk around and hang out in. So that that's kind of where we are in our vision and, and looking at this um, downtown district as, as we look towards revitalization. So I think what we'd like to start now that we know a little bit about Brunswick and um, and we've actually already had this question in the chat. So this is great. We can start right off with a uh, question that has come up. Um, which is a little bit about the difference between um, conservation districts and historic districts and why you felt this was the right tool for you and how why that's an important process to make sure you are picking the right tool for your community. Yeah, so, so oh, go ahead, oh, Kelly. Okay, um, so for us, uh, it was really focusing on uh, not only what a conservation district is, but what it isn't. And for us, it was you couldn't really um, try to develop a historic district and then call it another name. So it's not uh, a historic district by another name. It's actually something very separate um, and very different. And we felt that for us, uh, Nick likes to use the term preservation light. And so when we were doing our research, um, we just really felt that the difference between the conservation and the historic district was really in the implementation and in the um, sort of the, the breadth and depth of the, I'll, I'll use the word rules, but um, that seemed to really fit us a little bit better. Does anyone else have anything they'd like to build on that? Yeah, um, I was just gonna say, you know, to kind of set a little bit of history, um, for kind of how we arrived here 
the, the city of Brunswick underwent kind of looking at its downtown area and um, submitting that to the National Registry, doing a survey um, and, and getting this area actually on the National Register of Historic Places and having a historic district. So that, that began in the 1970s here in Brunswick. Um, that, that paperwork was done and submitted and accepted um, by the National Park Service. And then kind of phase two of that would be the actual local municipality would then adopt legislation to formally recognize the district and implement, um, you know, the Secretary of Interior standards and really implement the process that we would need for people when they're permitting or making changes to their property, demolition, additions, et cetera, to follow that. That is the piece, and I think many people can relate to the relate to. That's the piece that failed here. Um, there's frequently a lot of political um, issues that surround trying to adopt a historic district. Um, you know, people feel that they're going to be told what to do with their property, and it's going to be burdensome, and all of the different things that I'm sure many people out there are familiar with. So that is what happened here. Is is it failed to um, any any legislation failed to pass, and the city did not revisit that for many, many years um, and until recently, we decided that we did want to revisit that, but we decided that we wanted to revisit it in a way that made sense and kind of got public input and opinion. So um, I kind of wanted to start at the beginning of the process. So um, we talked a little bit about that the, in the past, you know, there is a National Register District there. Um, the, the local protections, that process did not come to fruition the first time it was tried. Um, so how did it, the ball kind of get rolling for this? And this is something I'd like to hear each of you kind of talk about since you each came to it from different ways. How did you get involved? Like what was the impetus for you to get involved in the conservation district uh, plan? Well, when I was first running for city council, um, there were a lot of concerns about development downtown. And we quickly realized that we didn't have any regulations at all covering what could or could not be done with any of the buildings, aside from the county building code. Um, and, and, that's, and that's a problem. I mean, it's very important to realize whether you have a historic district or a conservation district or anything else, that your legislation has to be in place before the development projects come along. Um, or else or else they can't be applied. And then it just turns into a, a large partisan argument about what is appropriate and what isn't appropriate when you should have objective regulations in place. Um, and that's also to benefit the developers. It's important to point that out. This is not an anti-development thing, um, but development is easier to foster if the developers know going in what is and is not allowed, what is and is not permitted. Um, so that they can make plans and say, well, my project doesn't fit, or they might say, my project would fit great, let's talk. Um, so that's that's the realization we came to when I was running for city council. Um, and so when when I got elected, one of the things I wanted to move forward was getting some sort of plan, regulation, district, whatever we could do in place uh, so that, um, the future projects coming down the line could be handled more appropriately. Mm -hmm. uh, Kelly? Um, well, I come from it from a different perspective as a citizen. I know Andy and, and Nathan are both, um, you know, elected officials. So it's a little bit different for them now. Um, for me, it was definitely piggybacking on the development comment. Um, a few years ago, we got involved um, in learning about a proposed development that would possibly demolish some of our historic structures. And so we talked a little bit about, about preservation with some preservation experts and um, just kind of learned about the process of what is a historic district and learned, you know, what does it mean to be on the National Register and what is a conservation district and learned what could apply to our city and what what would be the best tool? And then kind of learning at the time that we really didn't have tools, like Andy said, um, just kind of learning about all of the different, about all the different tools. But more importantly, um, we, at the same time, almost simultaneously, we had been in, the city had been involved in um, developing a small area plan. And at that time, that was also a, a citizen involved process 
wherein we could sort of voice what was important to us, what we valued as citizens. And it kept coming up that people valued history and they valued preservation and they valued our, our downtown and they valued um, just preservation in general, not just the preservation of, of our community, but um, just as a concept in general. And that kept coming up as a, as a topic. And so um, we made the suggestion a few times during the small area plan process that maybe we should revisit the historic district or the conservation district. And the mayor at the time, which was Mayor Snoots, um, he listened to those suggestions. We had Preservation Maryland come and talk with him about the difference and um, about what that process might look like. And um, from there, that sort of developed into the mayor and council adopting um, the preservation committee. So it really was sort of, for me, a citizen involvement and a citizen-led initiative wherein we started learning and then we started learning these new things. And then the small area plan was sort of simultaneous and other citizens were saying the same thing. So it, it became, um, we took it to the mayor and council and they agreed. And Nathan? Yeah, so I really echo a lot of what Andy and Kelly said. Um, I joined the city council the same time that Andy did. And I think we both kind of share these sentiments that there was, no matter how you feel about different projects or different, or what you want to see downtown, there was no clear process. And for me, it really is about the city laying out a process that anybody can follow, rather you're a developer or you're somebody that just owns a property downtown or you're somebody that loves history and you want to buy a property and preserve it. Um, you know, there should be a clear process that makes sense to everyone. Like, you know, like Andy said, going into it, you want to know what you're getting yourself into. And, you know, we don't have that, which has caused a lot of confusion. And I think in many cases, you know, we hear the argument that a historic district will hurt economic development, um, which is just not true. In many cases, I think not having a clear process or some kind of district or legislation actually hurts economic development because people don't know what you want and they see people come and present ideas and kind of get, oh no, we don't want that, but you can't actually point them to what, what you do want. So that's why I found this process to be, you know, really vital to, um, the revitalization of downtown this this is where we had to start is laying out what we do want to see and what would be allowed uh, that kind of preserves our history but also kind of lays our roadmap for the future um, the other part of that as well is the conservate or the preservation and revitalization committee for me um, as an elected official we could have immediately just revisited okay we already are on the national registry let's go ahead and adopt the templated historic district language which mm -hmm. you know the state has lots of language and there are lots of municipalities that already have that um but we started down this path of implementing a committee with citizens on it who had an interest in this because we wanted more facts and more research to be done about what the options are and what a historic district means and what are some of the hurdles because we knew doing that that there would be there would be concerns from property owners about what that would mean for their property and so we said let's you know let's take a different approach let's look let's have this committee implemented and really look let them do the research and provide recommendations to us and let us kind of sort through what our path should be forward um, and I have to say that, uh, you know, I've been the council liaison with the committee since its inception. And now that I've been elected to mayor, Andy is now the council liaison. It's it's probably been one of the greatest things I've been involved in. It's been such a productive committee that has really, we've learned from so many other communities and we've looked at so much legislation that other communities have passed and read through it. And we've brainstormed what we think would work here, what wouldn't work here. We've had several public workshops. We've had joint meetings with the Planning Commission and the Mayor and Council um, all along the process to really sort out some of the constant themes that come up or the issues that are surrounded with historic districts. Um, so kind of to speak to that, and this is also getting back to the question, some of the questions of conservation district versus historic district, you talked a little bit about predictability for developers, for homeowners, um, you know, getting those kinds of sets of standards that everyone can follow. Um, so what kinds of gaps in those standards 
um, do you feel like the conservation district versus historic district kind of fills in? And yeah, whoever would like to. <laughs> When we looked at the inventory of our structures, we were deciding what our boundary uh, should look like, which was probably one of our largest conversations is what should the boundary look like? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, we had sort of determined that a lot of our structures had in some way been already altered. So there was sort of this gap of um, how do we how do we make this not a burden on people who own these structures? that have already been significantly altered. Um, putting a historic district would put pretty significant regulations on that. Um, so that was a big gap that we had to talk about and learn about and really think about what kind of burden it would put on property owners and but would still achieve our goals of preservation. Mm -hmm. So I would say that was probably one of our largest um, gaps that we were looking to fill with the conservation district versus a historic district. Yeah, I think it's also important to note that a major gap we had is that there was literally no protection at all going into this, mm -hmm. aside from the city and county zoning regulations. And all that said was, it was a, I think it was a commercial area and you could also use, build multifamily residential. Uh, so aside from the fact that you couldn't build a toxic waste incinerator or some similar industrial plant in the downtown area, there was nothing there that said anything about how that property, the properties could or should be preserved or renovated or rebuilt or anything like that. Um, so and to my mind, that was a major gap. And that was one thing that I wanted to fill with something. And if a historic district is too restrictive, well, a conservation district can be the next best thing. Um, so yeah. I kind of want to get, oh, sorry, Nathan, go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say that, yeah, I think it goes back to also um, if, if as elected officials, you, and even as citizens, if you want to see some input in what happens to a specific area, there has to be legislation and a process. And so that that's clearly what we were lacking and why we kind of set down this path. And to piggyback on those answers, we didn't we didn't really have what we would consider an inventory of our structures. We didn't have um, we had some pictures. We didn't have we had the National Register nomination that was old. Um, so not only did we not have the tools and the legislation, we didn't really even know what we had. So, mm -hmm. so that was uh, another starting point that we had to fill in. So I, we kind of now have the background on, you know, the whys and everything. So we're going to talk a little bit now about the process. So you guys, um, you know, took a lot of care to make sure that there was a lot of citizen engagement. Um, and so um, I would say uh, that, that kind of the first question is, can you talk a little bit, and uh, Nathan, I think I'm gonna throw this over to you first about some steps um, that you took to ensure that there was a smooth process that no one felt blindsided. Yeah, again, um, you know, I think it was, you, we had many options. We could have just immediately deliberated as a, as a elected body to implement a historic district. There's lots of templated language out there. It's done all over the state. Uh, the Maryland Historical Trust, it's something that they can, you know, they assist with. Mm -hmm. um, but for us, we didn't want to repeat the 70s. <laughs> you know, we knew that we, we, you know, anybody I think that's involved in this process probably knows that there is a lot of public opposition to this because you are adding additional regulation on private property, um, no matter which way you look at it. Um, now, you can debate whether it's positive or negative, um, and, I, and I personally think there's more positives than negatives to doing this, but, you know, you have to really get the public and the property owners on your side, um, otherwise it's going to be a consistent argument. So that's why I was really strongly feeling that we needed the committee um, to really do a lot of that research and, and figure out, you know, what other places had done, what had worked well, what had not worked well. Um, what we want to do here, how it would fit into here, and 
along the way, you know, a lot of that public engagement. And I think what helped us with that as well, with that public engagement is right out of the gate, we did get a lot of comments like, oh, this will hinder economic development. This will um, tell me what color I have to paint my house. And this, you know, all of the typical kind of comments you get because the committee had done so much research and, and worked through that, we were able to kind of quickly refute a lot of those comments and explain why they were not inaccurate and or why they were inaccurate. And surprisingly, a lot of people that was helpful. You know, we, we had the resources right there to show them that, you know, a lot of the ways they were thinking were not incorrect or, or were incorrect and this is how it could be helpful. Um, so yeah, I think there was just a lot of, um, kind of research and, and and trying to have conversations with people uh, to get their view and kind of explain a differing perspective of it. And one, uh, one thing, one step I know you guys took that I thought was uh, interesting was that you did a demolition moratorium. And um, I don't know, Andy, if you want to say a couple words about uh, the benefit of that to, um, to the process. Oh yeah. The, uh, we, identified fairly early on that there we had some concerns that certain property owners might try to run in and, and tear buildings down if they thought that something like this might be coming down the road and as it turns out we were correct we did have a, a couple instances of people trying to uh file for permits that actually got stopped by the moratorium when it was enacted um but it's uh I mean, it, in order for the committee to get its work done, it ha we had to provide a safe and stable environment for that to happen. And mm -hmm. that can't happen when people are, are people are running out to demolish buildings for no reason other than the fact that they think they might not be able to later. Mm -hmm. um, so, and we consulted our city attorney when we uh, to get some draft legislation together and, and find out under what circumstances that would be permitted and under what restrictions and the uh in a nutshell it's it is permissible under certain circumstances like these if you specifically define the area and you specifically define a time frame and you specifically tie it to an ongoing effort to actually pass legislation so a municipality can't just say you're not permitted to demolish a building unless the city council authorizes it but you can say you're not permitted to demolish a building without authorization for the next six months or 18 months or however long in order for this particular city legislative effort to complete. Um, and we just had to extend that moratorium till the end of the year because we're still in the process of finalizing the legislation for the conservation district. Um, but the well, I guess that's all there is to say about that. <laughs> um, and one thing too is, you know, um, you know, because I know you guys have had some development concerns, and one thing that I know we talked about when we were planning this is like this is broader than just any one project. And um, Kelly, I was wondering if you could talk, since you are a citizen, and you know, how, how to make this kind of something that in Kind of the general public's mind it isn't necessarily reactionary it's proactive if that makes sense rather than um kind of making that distinction for people that this is something bigger than one project sure um you know i come i'm originally from loudon county and um i've been working in the museum and history field for quite some quite many years i don't want to say how long but um but i we looked at so many communities where um, having a historic district or, well, we looked at conservation districts too, but historic districts were just um, success stories. Um, places where maybe there once wasn't a thriving community where now there was people, you know, they were bringing in tourism dollars. They were bringing in uh, new development as it was appropriate. They were bringing in business and economic recovery and revitalization. And we really wanted that to be our focus. We wanted it to be like, how can our community not, not be a, a, you know, a baby Frederick or anything like that, but how can our community look at um, our, I, I'm gonna say beautiful <laughs> resources that we have to sort of mimic those successes um, 
because we, we there was just so many examples of where that works um, that we had traveled all over to see and some of our committee members did too went to places and they would come and report back this is what this community is doing and this is working and um, so we really focused on the broader perspective of what does it really mean to have this and what do we value about it and um, that just goes so much farther than one thing. I mean, as a historian myself, it's it's really having a sense of community and a sense of place and providing that for people um, to come and enjoy all of the things that, that we have. So I tried to steer the committee in, in that direction. So I hope that answers your question. But to me, that, that made it a part of the broader narrative, um, just in general, putting it in perspective of so many other places that had that had sort of what I we developed that we wanted. I, I would add to that that what you don't find are the counterexamples. You're not going to find you don't find towns around the state or around the country where they've passed some sort of historic preservation ordinance and it's been a disaster that's killed the town. There there just aren't any counterexamples to that. Um, and that, that was a big factor too. I mean, we had several people try to tell us that this was somehow going to prevent people from fixing up their buildings downtown. And my initial reaction was, well, you know, not having this hasn't gotten them to do it. So I don't, I don't see as how while passing this is going to hurt anything. And the second thing I thought was, well, the counter example, I'm not seeing all these towns around the country where historic preservation has somehow killed things because it hasn't happened. That is a fake narrative. Okay. Uh, sorry, I apparently had a little bit of internet trouble there. Um, I hope everyone is is back. Uh, apologies if anyone lost something for a moment. Um, I think we are back on. Um, can everyone hear me? Thumbs up on the, the webinar? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Sorry, I got a flash that said I was disconnected. Um, apologies about that. Um, so... I know that you guys took special steps to make sure that people were talked to about this. And I know we talked about some of it, um, just kind of very nuts and bolts. Like what are some things, um, Nathan, if you want to take this one as, as kind of liaison between there, what did you do to make sure elected officials were um, outside of working with the committee um, to kind of talking to the broader community too? Yeah, so I think um, throughout the process, um, from my perspective in liaisoning with the with the committee, some things that I was was looking for was not just participating in the committee and the discussions and all the research. I tried to frequently take a step back and say, okay, are we at a place that we need to now have an update at a public meeting? Um, mm -hmm. You know, with the mayor and council, are we at a place that we need to confer with planning and zoning commission? Uh, or our planning staff. Um, and, and that happened frequently throughout the process where, you know, when we discussed the boundary, for example, we wanted to make sure that everybody, you know, we didn't just want to draw a boundary and then, you know, say, well, this passed and, you know, you're now in this. We actually took steps to have our planning department uh, compile a letter that really explained what we were doing and we mailed it to every potential impacted property um, invited them to a public hearing and, and give their comments um, on, you know, what they thought about doing this. And then, you know, part of that was, of course, we heard a lot of the normal, you know, you're going to tell me what to do and what color to paint my house and all of these different things. But it allowed for an opportunity for us to really explain what we were trying to do and how we were not trying to do that and how we felt it would be beneficial. And that conversation was important because a lot of people ended up understanding after time that, you know, what we were doing could be very positive and could assist them. And we were not just trying to pass legislation that told them what color to paint their house. Yeah, that's the example I always use because that's the one I always hear is you're going to tell me that I have to paint my house a specific color. Um, Don't forget the windows. Yeah. And the windows. Yes, <laughs> windows are always a big topic in historic preservation, what you can do with windows. So, so we also, um, um, oh, sorry, go ahead, Kelly. Just a really, just a really quick, um, for people who couldn't attend meetings, we also provided a, a way for them to directly comment to us through a city web form. So I just want to point that out too. That was really important because 
we we would love to have meetings every single night and <laughs> so that everybody could you know be accommodated be accommodating and attend, but people who couldn't attend, we did allow people to send in comments. They went directly to our planning department and then to the committee. So people really did have, you know, more than just one night to, to say how they felt, or maybe they felt something and wanted to say it later and they could. So that was important to us as well. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, I think kind of what I want to bring up, you guys sent me a really fantastic map of what the conservation district looks like, because the next thing we have kind of talk about is the uh, is the importance of following the process and you know you guys have talked in some of our discussions before this about the importance of making sure that um, uh, let's see this is the overall view here um, of making sure like boundaries that everything you were doing everything by the book and making sure you're going through um, through the process so um, I'm hoping everyone at home can can read what is there so the red is the historic district. Um, the yellow is a small area plan. Um, the uh, the purple is the Main Street boundary. And then I believe that is it. Am I right that the green is the conservation district or no? Purple. Our our boundary mimics the Main Street boundary. Okay. So the okay. Is just where we have a TOD overlay. Um, it's just gotcha. showing that overlay there. Okay. Okay, there's my understanding. So the purple is, yes, is the district there. Um, so I know you guys put a ton of thought into boundaries, boundaries of conservation district versus the historic district. Um, maybe Andy, we'll start with you. Um, can you talk a little bit about the, uh, the boundary process? Uh, I actually was not involved in the boundary process, so. Oh, well, there you go. Okay, well, Nathan, <laughs> we'll start with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the, the committee had a lot of good discussions about the boundary development, and I think um, those discussions would definitely be helpful to other people who are thinking about um, adopting something like this, because we started with looking at the boundaries we already have. Uh, the small area plan, like Kelly mentioned earlier, was kind of a study that the city did that looked at the downtown area, and there were sp specific criteria based on um, based on relation to the train station for commuters. Um, and that's kind of how that boundary ended up being derived. And so that's where we started looking at, um, because that's where the, the this kind of idea was born, was from the small area plan that people were interested in, in preservation. And then once we really got into the discussion, we looked at all of our boundaries. Um, the, the discussion we heard over and over was, one of the reasons people felt that the historic district failed in the 70s was that the boundary was much too large. Um, so you can see that that's a pretty large boundary compared to the other areas that we're looking at. Now that that historic district does make sense in the context of what it was submitted. That that is kind of um, you know some of the earliest construction of downtown or of of Brunswick in general. Um, so so that made sense. But then trying to implement that district and, and codify that and have legislation, it was just much too large for the city size to manage. So people felt that that's one reason the historic district didn't pass. The Main Street boundary, um, we got a Main Street program about 15 years ago in Brunswick, and there has been lots of discussion and kind of well thought out uh, process there for how the Main Street boundary is. And what this map doesn't show is the Main Street boundary actually follows some of our zoning track with what's what's zoned commercial um, in our downtown because that was kind of their main focus was commercial properties. So when we kind of really started to assess in the committee what our goals were and what we would hope to see accomplished, um, it was pretty pretty much that our desire was to at least protect kind of the commercial district of Brunswick, you know, have protections with a lot of our larger historic uh, commercial structures. If we were going to accomplish anything, that was what we had hoped to accomplish. Um, so that's kind of where we started and the Main Street boundary had already had a lot of good discussions about that. The other part of it in talking to the city attorney and talking to our planning and zoning department, um, you know, you can't just kind of go in and arbitrarily draw a line and say, this is our boundary. You know, your boundary has to be defensible, that it, it makes sense for why you're doing that. 
Uh, so sticking with our Main Street boundary was defensible. It, you know, it's a boundary, like I said, that has been in implemented for the last 15 years and has been successful um, in the different programs that they um, offer. So that's kind of how we settled to go in that direction. Yeah, and I just pulled up the kind of detail map that has that Main Street boundary um, outlined a little bit. So it gave you kind of the sense of, of, those, of the large scale. Um, you know, and this is actually a question that just came in on our, our questions, but it's something I know we've talked about too while we were discussing this session, is that, um, you know, it's not like, oh, we failed in a historic district, now we're going to create a conservation district because we couldn't get this. It's, there's, there's, there's more to that than just saying, okay, that, that word is wrong, we're going to do the exact same thing, but we're going to make it this. And so I'm hoping maybe, um, and uh, Nathan, if you want to, you want to kick this off. Just kind of that um, that distinction there. What kind of the um, I don't know if like the authorizing, <laughs> you know, thing. But what makes that what makes it different to be able to approach this? Not just saying, oh, we couldn't get this done, so now this is our backup. But kind of what makes it a unique a unique entity? Yeah, I think that's a great question because um, we definitely we started with oh, there was a historic district boundary drawn and it failed. And so we started saying, why, you know, why did that happen? What were the reasons? Um, and so we heard, you know, lots of different comments. Like I said, one being that the boundary was much too large to implement. Um, the second was that it included lots of residential properties and, you know, that was difficult um, to kind of manage that aspect of it. And then the other piece was what actually you're hoping to achieve if you're if you really are focused on kind of your commercial district uh, is the boundary capturing that. Um, the other part of it is, is that's a great question about, you know, this is not just a historic district being called something else. So um, part of that was, OK, what were the concerns with having a historic district, regardless of the boundary at that time? And Kelly, I think, alluded to some of this. Part of it was a lot of the structures in our, even our overall historic district boundary have already been significantly changed over the years. Um, so if, if you really look at what we're trying to do, you know, we're, if, are you just really trying to make sure that you know, kind of the height, the architectural look and feel, and if you have new construction or additions, et cetera, are those things kind of fitting in with your district and people can't just build whatever they want that fits, you know, building code. Um, so part of that is historic district gets a lot more specific in that in dictating types of materials and, um, you know, a variety of other things where the conservation district really just to me kind of skims the surface that, we're kind of putting out guidelines that show the look and the feel and how tall you can build structures and, you know, how you should design them. Or if you make exterior renovations, you should do them in a way where if you have kind of the recessed doorways or something like that, which we have a lot of in downtown, that you don't take that off and, and significantly change the front of the structure. Uh, so that's kind of where our focus was. It's very high level. We wanted to make sure we captured those types of things, but we didn't want to go as far as a historic district that said, no, you know, you took that off. You have to put it back exactly or, you know, the shutter. We wanted to be able to have flexibility as well to work with people, knowing that we don't have a bustling downtown. Um, so we want to kind of balance the preservation piece with the revitalization piece and hopefully get some some uh, economic booming going on here. Um, so we're going to we're going to be wrapping up kind of a few questions for the panel um, about kind of how they're they're feeling is working where we are right now is going to be the last one. But if you guys have any questions, I do see some coming in and um, there's been some that have been great. They've been fitting right into kind of my outline. So I appreciate that. Um, uh, but yes, do please keep the questions coming. And then um, so for you guys, um, uh, Kelly, what can you tell us a little bit about where the process is now? So right now we have developed, of course you see our boundary, we've developed our guidelines and we've developed the um, ordinances that will need to go uh, to, the mayor, to the planning commission and to the mayor and council um, to all be adopted. Um, they're in legal review. Um, I believe they've come back. Nathan, you can 
you can fill that part in. But um, we are kind of in a holding pattern a little bit right now, uh, but we're we're almost to the finish line, getting the uh, all of the items to the planning commission, which will then make their recommendation to the mayor and council for eventual adoption. So we are we're in the home stretch. We're getting there. Yeah, we um, we were hoping to adopt or or this to go before planning commission and then before mayor and council for hopeful adoption of our conservation district, our ordinance, our guidelines and boundary. Um, but we are at the process of we sent it to legal review and it's kind of been two uh, through two rounds of that. Um, and so now we've kind of pushed out a month on that, trying to get everything done. Um, you know, part of this is this is a unique. Um, process, which is one reason we're probably having the webinar today. Um, this is not common. We found that there are only a few conservation districts that exist, and they actually exist very differently than what we're doing. Uh, you know, they're typically small areas with very limited uh, guidelines in place, whereas ours is much more involved. So, you know, when we got to legal review, there was some confusion. And the question that came in, one of them was, is is this a historic district being called something else? <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> kind of going through the steps of why it's different and where it's different and how the guidelines differ from Secretary of Interior standards that most historic districts follow, you know, we've, we've now gone back and forth with legal on that. So it's required more of a discussion than just a, a simple review, like, yes, that looks good. So that's kind of where we are. And just so everybody knows, I threw um, I threw up in our chat a link to the draft guidelines, which are available on the City of Brunswick's um, website. So um, if anyone wants to check those out, and I'll make sure those are included too, in um, whoop, apologies uh, in our in our follow up email to this. Um, so just um, final reminder for any questions that come in, and then I guess I just want to go around and hear from each of you. Um, if you think the process met the goals when you started. So Andy, we'll start with you. Uh, oh yes, it did meet the goals. I mean, my goal was to have some sort of process in place that would do something to protect the buildings downtown. And we've got that. We have a system that will allow developers to know what's expected of them and to allow citizen, uh, property owners to know what's expected of them. Um, and we will have that. So I'm I'm fine on that score. I think it's important to underscore the uh, level of objectivity that we've tried to inject into this process. I mean, we've used legal review and citizen workshops. Um, we have made sure that uh, the, the the downtown preservation committee did not was not solely consisting entirely of people who were crazy about preservation at all costs. We had to have all all viewpoints included in there. Um, uh, let's see, I mentioned the legal review and on oh, the inventory. We had the inventory conducted by an outside contractor. Uh, so that it's, I mean, as a legislator, I don't want to be making that decision as part of a political process because then you get into an argument about, well, did this person's house get included because you like them or don't like them or, or what? Uh, you want every part of this process to be objective uh, so that it can survive legal challenges and so that people think it's fair. Um, Nathan? Yeah, uh, one thing I would add to what Andy said I think was important is um, this process opened a lot of doors to other things. You know, we may not have mentioned that. I mentioned that we did our survey, uh, National Register survey in the 70s. This process led us to quickly the committee determining that we needed to redo the survey. We needed a reevaluation because the data was old. We've had fires and kind of the district has significantly changed over the years. So we wanted, we, we hired a contractor to come in and, and redo the survey and that work is underway to resubmit to the, the um, National Park Service. So, you know, this process, you, you, you set out on it with one thing and, and other things kind of grow from it. Uh, like Andy said, I think the importance that we found early on was the committee one of the arguments we've had in Brunswick for years is what's historic and what's not historic, and then what is just old that people think are historic. 
um, or have has a historic significance. And as Andy said, as a legislator, I don't I don't have any expertise in that. I don't want to make those decisions. You know, I haven't built a career around that. Um, and, and you know, the gold standard for that is really having a survey that is submitted in this country. It, you know, it's submitted to the federal government, and the National Park Service, mm -hmm. and they kind of review and accept that and determine contributing and non-contributing structures. And that that process kind of tells you what's historic and what's not historic. Um, and the state uses the same process. You know, if, if things go for state review to MHT, they look at if something's on a register and contributing and non-contributing and all of those different factors. So, um, you know, that, that quickly on helped us. So if I think if somebody goes down this process and they have nothing in place, you know, it may be a good idea to, to um, look at the National Register uh, survey process as kind of helping you determine what's historic and what's not. Um, because otherwise you're going to have 10 different people in your community with 10 different opinions about what is historic and what's not historic. Um, I've been really pleased with the process. I've learned a lot. I think the committee has done an outstanding job, uh, like Andy said, with, with really being um, thinking about things from all angles. How are we going to be able to achieve our goal of historic preservation, but also do it in a way that's sensitive to property owner concerns and sensitive to the fact that we all have a common goal of seeing not just a preserved downtown, but a downtown that people actually use and appreciate. Uh, you know, we don't want to just turn it into a museum and people come and look at it. We want it to actually be functional. Um, so kind of navigating all those different viewpoints has been really important. And I think the committee's done a very good job of that. Anything you'd like to add, Kelly? Um, you know, as the committee chair, we were definitely tasked with certain, uh, well, tasks, <laughs> and I think those are really coming to to fruition. Um, we've worked so hard. Everybody's been really dedicated. I think you've probably heard our our stories of we met more than probably every other committee ever has, um, <laughs> meeting weekly when we first started. Um, so as the as the committee chair, definitely, I think um, we've learned a lot. We've we're get we're you know we're getting to the finish line and we're getting those deliverables. Um, as going back to being a citizen, um, for me, we've talked as a committee as what are our next steps? You know, once we get all of this passed and everybody's implementing it well and everything's working, um, what's next? And um, that's where I really think that we have we have more work to do. Um, getting the community to really have that sense of place and that pride in what in what this is and what we've done and that in seeing um, you know history is more than just the buildings that are sitting there it's the people who lived in them and worked in them and what they did and how they did it and um, just kind of seeing that as uh, themselves as a part of that and that mm -hmm. I think that's really important for me um, as a next step and what what we haven't fulfilled yet but we're you know that's what we're gonna <laughs> keep going and working on, so. Well, we have a couple kind of nuts and boltsy questions that are in the um, question box that I think uh, would be good um, for here. So um, you answered, there was a question about the inventory gap, which I think you answered. You hired a consultant to, to help you out with that. Is that, am I understanding correctly? Okay. Um, so there was also a question about um, which local entity has the review authority over uh, the conservation district? That's a very good question. Um, and that's a question that um, has probably caused the most conversation and work in the committee of the last couple of months. Um, so most that's historic it. districts um, follow the process where you implement a commission. And the commission sort of makes recommendations or kind of decisions of how to implement uh, the ordinance language. Um, we were, again, sensitive to the size of Brunswick and the amount of commissions and committees we already have and the difficulty finding volunteers. Um, so that process has been kind of ironed out through the committee and thought about in many different ways and what's possible. And we decided that we would follow the typical city planning commission process. Um, now we've made a couple of edits, recognizing that the planning commission doesn't always have people who are versed in historic preservation. Um, we decided that the city would need any applications that came forward that were relative to the district 
the city would either have a consultant or we would work with the county or other municipal governments who do have um, somebody with historic preservation. Like, for example, the city of Frederick, I believe, has two staff members that are versed in historic preservation. Frederick County government has one or two people um, that work with their commissions. So we're hoping to kind of work with them to give kind of the um, staff review, so to speak, on the different applications mm -hmm. that come forward with somebody that has that kind of knowledge can, can kind of provide their analysis of what we're looking at. Um, and then they would work with our planning department who would then ultimately they would go before the planning commission. Okay. Um, so we had a question come in, um, and I'd be interested. I'm hope you might guys might all have the exact same answer, but we'll see. Um, the question is, what require what parts of the draft guidelines were the most and least contested? So we can maybe start with is was there a point that everyone just agreed um, when you were uh, drafting these guidelines? Is there something I was like, yep, great, we got that. We had conversations about public art. Okay. That was one thing that, that came up, um, especially with uh, when we talked with Main Street um, and in wanting to, to really foster arts and entertainment here, making sure that our guidelines didn't in, in any way deter from that um, or discourage it. So public art was one. Um, windows are always one. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, Nathan, can you think of? I, I'm trying. I wish all. I wish all of our committee were on here because they probably remember <laughs> me. Um, yeah, I, I think public art uh, windows. Um, just the actual boundary. We had lots of discussions mm -hmm. about the boundary, and um, you know that Definitely. process. I think people. What we talked for weeks about the boundary, but we, we then realized that there's even a legal aspect to the boundary, you know, making sure that a boundary is defensible. We can't just draw a line on a map and say, well, here's, you know, why did we do that and what's defensible? So, uh, you know, boundary comes up a lot and boundary goes back to that conversation that I, I think you don't want to get bogged down where you create a committee or you create a group that is trying to determine what is historical and what is not historical. You you really should follow the process that's already out there for that uh, because 10 different people on a committee are going to give you 10 different opinions on what's historical and not. Mm -hmm. And then the public is never going to buy into any of their opinions unless they have some kind of professional, um, you know, credentials behind that to back up why they're saying that. Yeah. Lighting. Lighting came up. Yeah. Mm. That was one, especially because our our proposed district is a lot of commercial. So, mm -hmm. oh, that was another one. So, <laughs> I'm just saying. <thinking, laughs> now, um, I think I think that's probably because, like Nathan and we've said before, is that our our proposed district is a lot of commercial. So we had a lot of property owners who were concerned about about those things. I mean, in in terms of the least controversial, from where I could see outside of the committee, the the part that was most popular was the part where you said you could replace like with like, because a mm -hmm. lot of people were concerned they were going to have to revert, like if their windows had already been replaced or something like that, that they were going to have to revert to using something else. And when we said, no, if you've got replacement windows already, you can just go ahead and get new replacement windows. And if you've got vinyl siding already, it's okay to go ahead and get new vinyl siding rather than having to go back to um, the old wooden boards or something like that. That a lot of people seem pretty positive about that. I don't think anybody complained about it at all. Um, so I guess one thing kind of looking towards the future, um, I know something that we talked about um, kind of planning this was that there, you know, part of the process and part of that engagement process was separating out the, the fact from the fear and getting people to know um, kind of what their facts were about this. So um, kind of speaking to the things that of uh, the windows and other things like that. Um, it's the process still ongoing to kind of allay any lingering concerns as this goes into kind of its final phases? Yeah, I think we are, um, the committee's still focused on, we put together a lot of resources and we're still, I think, committed to that, the kind of the educational piece as it's implemented and um, working through that. We also are, 
hoping to not just pass legislation that says, okay, you now must all do this. We're also wanting to explore ways to incentivize people in this district. Um, you know, lots of historic districts come with tax credits or other programs. Uh, mm -hmm. So we're, you know, we're actively in our committee discussing the different options that are out there that other municipalities have um, and how we could implement them or adopt them to the historic district. Um, and kind of incentivize the properties being fixed up. Um, and then, you know, part of that as well is it, it goes with our Main Street District, which our Main Street District already also has programs that they work through the state of Maryland for funding to assist people with renovations and kind of facades and things like that. So, you know, I think all of those things that we're going to continue to kind of explore, engage what the public needs and how we can implement this and and provide that educational piece to help people through it we don't just want to say here go follow this now we we want people to recognize that this is actually a good thing uh that when you look 20 years from now in brunswick people will say that was a great decision that they made to do that and it's it's sparked what we have now. any other uh comments on that so um we are just about out of time. Um, I really, really, really want to thank the panelists for being here. Um, like I said, this is a unique process and something um, that is is really very new. So I appreciate everyone sharing their thoughts. And hopefully, um, I know we have some people from out of state, um, as well as people from Maryland. So I'm hoping this has been um, really helpful for people that are maybe considering this process in their own community. Um, we will be, uh, this has been recorded, um, and we will be able to uh, put this up on both our website, but also everyone who is on this call right now, um, you will be getting an email um, either today or tomorrow uh, with a copy of the video, as well as um, some of the links that we talked about here that are up in the chat, as long as um, like a copy of the map, a copy of the draft guidelines, um, good resources for you to follow up. And if anyone has any other questions that occur to them, please feel free to email me um, at jfell at presmd.org and I'm happy to get um, questions out to the panelists. Um, so thank you so much um, for, for being here with us today, uh, Kelly, Andy, and Nathan. It's really, really fantastic. And thank you for all the hard work. I know you guys have just been working on this so hard for so long, and I really appreciate you sharing your stories with us today. Thank you for having us. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Thank you, and um, I hope to see uh, some of you at our next sessions in October, and uh, have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.